78-year-old Samuel Little sits across a table from a Texas Ranger matter-of-factly describing how he took the lives of many of his victims. He's frail, wheelchair-bound, and has heart disease and diabetes. With armed guards around him, he talks about how he got away with over 90 murders in 19 states over a period of decades. He doesn't seem to have a care in the world, which is why he's been described as pure evil. From 1970 to 2005, this man traveled from state to state covering much of the US in search of vulnerable women that would satisfy his deranged needs. In 1971, in Kendall, Florida, there was a Sarah or Donna. He describes this Jane Doe perfectly and then sketches her face for investigators. He does the same for a 25-year-old woman he says he met outside a strip club in 1984 when driving to Cincinnati. Slight of frame, short blonde hair, blue eyes, and with the look of what he calls a hippie, her fate was sealed when she got in the car. These confessions with their detailed descriptions and it has to be said fairly accomplished sketches not only surprised investigators but rocked the USA. The authorities knew very well that Little wasn't making it up. Not all his confessions have been confirmed, but enough of them have for the FBI to announce that Mr. Little is the most prolific serial killer in US history. Before we get into some of those cases and how on earth he got away with his crimes, what do we know about Samuel Little, the child? We know he was born on June 7, 1940 in the small town of Reynolds, Georgia. This is a place that right now only has a population of just over a thousand, with almost a quarter of these people living below the poverty line. According to Little, he wasn't exactly born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Describing his mother's job of being a lady of the night, it's thought he was born in prison after his teenage mother had been arrested for plying what some people have called the oldest trade in the world. At one point, she gave up trying to look after her son and ditched him on the side of the road. That's a reason why, when growing up, Little spent a good deal of his time living with his grandmother in Lorain, Ohio. He attended Hawthorne Junior High School in Ohio, but it seems his grades were poor and behavior even poorer. He soon dropped out and set in motion what would become a lifetime of crime. At age 16 in 1956, he was convicted of the crime of breaking and entering and spent some time in a juvenile detention center. Five years later, he was sent to adult prison after being arrested for breaking into a Lorraine furniture store. For the rest of his free life, he moved from state to state, occasionally holding down jobs but always committing crimes. It's believed that before the man hit 35 years old, he was arrested at least 26 times in 11 states. Those crimes included assault, theft, fraud, DUI, breaking and entering, solicitation, armed robbery, shoplifting, aggravated assault on a police officer, and more. Little did the police know though, by this time he'd already started killing. By that time, the mid-70s rolled around. Stealing through the day and going out looking for women at night was how he spent many of his days. Those women were almost always African Americans living on the fringes of society. They were women who worked as prostitutes or were addicted to drugs or were homeless and living in shelters or all of those things. Little once commented, they was broke and homeless and they walked right into my spider web. His modus operandi didn't often change in that he went to the places where the most vulnerable people could be found and then he befriended women. Sometimes he'd offer them a ride in his car, sometimes he'd ask to go for a drink with them, at other times he tempted them with the promise of drugs. Once they'd gotten into his car, they had a little chance of surviving. This was a strong man, a muscular man who'd fought as a light heavyweight boxer. He'd often knock his victims clean out before strangling them, an act which gratified his perverse desires. Sometimes he'd stroke their necks, feigning intimacy, kindness, and then his powerful hands would tighten around him. His crimes shouldn't have gone on for as long as they did, but as you'll find out later, his choice of a victim was very likely the reason why he could do what he did and get away with it. He almost came unstuck at the start though. On September 11, 1976, a woman named Pamela K. Smith was found half naked, her hands tied behind her with electrical cord. Pounding on a stranger's house door, she screamed and shouted until someone came to help her. This woman, a drug addict, said Little had picked her up in the city of St. Louis. They'd driven around for a while and then parked in a quiet area. Little attacked her. She managed to escape and soon the cops found Little still in his car. He denied any kind of sexual motive for the attack and said in his own words, I only beat her. For that crime, he spent just three months in the county jail. Had the woman not escaped, that could have been a murder. Had she not been in trouble with the law in the past for her heroin addiction and failing to turn up in court on occasions, Little might have been scrutinized a little more. In 1982, a mentally disabled woman named Patricia Ann Mount was found in Forest Grove, Florida. This woman, who had an IQ of just 40, was last seen dancing with a man in a tavern. That man was Samuel Little. He was acquitted of the crime, with a defense attorney stating there's more doubt than there is fact. 
Many years later, Little would let the authorities know that he indeed had committed that murder. She wasn't his only victim in Florida either. Then there was Melinda Rose LaPree. Her body was found in 1982 in Pascagoula, Mississippi. She'd been dead a long time, so the body was in a state of advanced decomposition, which didn't help investigators. The night she went missing, she'd been working as a prostitute. When she left the streets in a station wagon, other women on the street saw the man who was driving the car. They gave a description of him to the police, and so when six weeks later Little was picked up in a traffic stop, he was taken in for questioning. Not only did one of those women pick out his image in a photo lineup, but another woman came forward and said the same man had assaulted her in the past. The problem was, prosecutors said there was no physical evidence to link Little with the murder. They said a positive ID wasn't enough to take the case to trial, so Little was allowed to go. An even worse blemish on the justice system is the fact that the district attorney's office said it wasn't happy about prosecuting a man when the only witnesses were prostitutes. Investigator Darren Versiga later said that the police back then were hesitant to believe assault claims from black prostitutes. Such discrimination is of course sad and patently unethical, but it's not that unusual, and certainly wasn't so unusual in the past. You'll see there's a term in the world of crime called the less dead people. These are the folks that serial killers often prey on. They're the poorest, most disenfranchised citizens, folks who can go missing and no one even reports it. Sometimes they end up as Jane or John Doe's, even if the police do have an ID. Due to their low socioeconomic status, and in some cases their rap sheet, they might not exactly drum up a lot of sympathy from the public or be the most pressing cases for homicide detectives. They were seen as less alive, less valued before they died, and so when they did die they became less dead, even though you'd think they'd elicit the most sympathy given their difficult circumstances. This is how one person described how law enforcement sometimes treats the less dead. A great deal less pressure is felt by the police when victims of crime come from the marginal elements. Samuel Little knew what he was doing by targeting society's most vulnerable. He talked about it once in an interview, saying, I never killed no senators or governors or fancy New York journalists, nothing like that. I kill a journalist, it'd be all over the news the next day. I stayed in the ghettos. The FBI has since said that many of his victims didn't look as though they'd been murdered. Since he punched and strangled the women, police often thought the cause of death was a drug overdose or an accident or death from natural causes. Still, others have written that police didn't look hard enough, and that's because the lives the women had led. Perhaps rather than rigorously scrutinize the cause of death, a death of a woman with a history of petty crime or drug use was sometimes overlooked. If you look at Little's many victims, almost every single one of them fits into the less dead category. We'll get around to them soon, but first let's see how Little was caught. In 1984, he was arrested in San Diego. He kidnapped one prostitute and left her for dead on a dirt road. And then a month after that, he was found on that same dirt road with an unconscious woman in his car. Both women had been hit hard and then choked, but both of them survived the ordeal. A jury couldn't reach a verdict and Little in the end pled guilty to the crimes of false imprisonment and assault with great bodily injury. He was out after only two and a half years, then moved to Los Angeles. During this time in the City of Angels, it's thought he killed at least another 10 women and at one point was arrested for possession of cocaine. He never turned up in court and then fled LA. He moved around yet again and had many brushes with the law, although because the warrant for his drug possession charge was non-extraditable, he was never sent back to LA to face the charges. It wasn't until September 5, 2012, when he was staying at a homeless shelter in Louisville, Kentucky, that his web of crime started to become untangled. An LAPD detective named Mitzi Roberts had been working on murder cases, and she found that Little's DNA could be connected to two murders. He eventually was extradited to California on a narcotics charge, and it's there that DNA testing linked him with a third murder. Shortly after this, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement was in contact with police from Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Los Angeles detectives were talking to these people too, and it soon became apparent that this is the guy that could have killed the women from one coast of the US to the other. He was charged in 2013 for the murders of three women in LA. One had been found in a dumpster, another in a garage, and the third down an alleyway. All three had been strangled. For those brutal crimes, he was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, all the time maintaining that he was an innocent man. It wasn't until 2018 when Little started dropping confession bombs. He was 78 and on the verge of death, and it's then that he started talking to law enforcement from various US states. 
These confessions solved the cases of many deaths police had deemed suspicious, as well as unsolved murders. Little had a good memory when it came to faces and how he'd killed each victim, although he wasn't always good with dates. What was surprising was the fact that he was able to accurately sketch many of the people he'd murdered. While cops might have suspected him to be behind a lot of murders, they weren't prepared for what he told them. They were in fact interviewing the most prolific serial killer in American history. There's such a thing as serial killers that have claimed to have killed many more people than they are convicted of killing. It's said serial killer Gary Ridgway might have killed many more than the 49 people he was convicted of killing, but that's not been proven. Richard Cottingham, aka the Butcher of Times Square, claimed to have killed 85 to 100 people during his 13 years hunting down women, but it remains to be seen if that's true. As for Little, it's now thought that he killed 93 people, but the FBI has said for now they can only confirm that he killed 60 women. It's likely he killed his first person back in 1970. The FBI had said this about Little's confession. He remembers where he was and what car he was driving. He draws pictures of many of the women he killed. It's very likely he did kill 93 women, given his honesty about the other murders and the details he could recall. Although corroborating his stories is still a work in progress. We'll give you some examples of what he told the FBI. The reason the FBI has put these examples on its website is so someone might be able to help them with their investigation. Maybe some of our viewers could be of help after hearing this. Little said sometime between 1992 and 1994 he met an African American woman in an area of Little Rock, Arkansas. He said it was a cold night and that it might have been snowing. The two went shoplifting together and Little was arrested for that. Police records corroborate the story. He got out of jail and went to move his car, which he said was a Cadillac Eldorado or a yellow Dodge. His accomplice was sleeping in the car. The next day after driving down an old dirt road, he stopped the car and committed the murder. He told police that he dumped the body near a cornfield. The problem is, Little couldn't remember her full name. He said he thought her first name was Ruth, but he wasn't sure. He was also able to sketch her face. Then there was the African American woman who he said he met in 1982 in New Orleans. He described her as being 30 to 40 years old, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 9 inches tall and weighing in the region of 160 pounds. He said her skin was honey colored brown and her hair was medium length. She was in a club celebrating someone's birthday when they met. Little and the woman left the club in a Lincoln Continental Mark III. She told him that she lived with her mom and that her mom was either very sick or an invalid since the woman had to look after her. Together they drove toward an area called Little Woods and took the exit off I-10. He said he drove down a dirt road where the canal was being dredged. He killed her and left her body next to the canal. He drew a picture of her, too. It was 1971 or 1972 when he met another one of his victims, this time in Miami, Florida. He said she was an 18 to 19 year old African American transgender person named Mary Ann or Marion. She was 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 7 inches tall and weighed around 140 pounds. The two met at a place called the Pool or Pool Palace which Little said was on 17th Avenue in Miami. It wasn't until a few days later that they met again. This time the location was the historic Overton neighborhood. During these meetings he said he learned that she lived with a bunch of roommates in either Brownsville or Liberty City. Little said he turned up at that house and one of the roommates asked him to go out and buy some shaving cream. He agreed and set off in his gold four-door Pontiac Le Mans except he had no intention of buying the cream. Instead, he and Marianne headed north on Highway 27. He said he stopped the car close to the sugarcane field and killed her there in someone's driveway. He then continued down Highway 27 until he reached the Everglades. He turned down a dirt road until he arrived at the river or a swamp. He dragged the body through the mud and the water and left the scene. These are just a few of the unmatched confessions. Others have been matched and murders have been solved. Although in some cases the bodies were never identified, so they're still Jane Doe's. It's uncertain how much guilt Little felt for what he'd done. Sometimes he smiled a lot while being interviewed. There was certainly no trace of remorse or shame in his voice or his face. He also once said he didn't fear God for what he'd done. I live in my mind now with my babies in my drawings, he said in one interview. By his babies, he was perversely referring to the women he'd heartlessly murdered. He also said in that interview, the only things I was ever good at was drawing and fighting. In fact, that's how he sometimes lured women, telling them that they were beautiful and then promising to employ his formidable artistic skills to draw them. He did just that to the victim in Odessa, Texas. He kept his promise, but she was already dead when he sketched her. Little died on December 30, 2020. The cause of death wasn't reported in the media, although he was a sick man. 